Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's United Church of Christ here in Crystal Lake, Illinois. I'm Pastor Greg. Thank you for worshiping with us through this online service. Today marks the conclusion of our solely online worship. Next Sunday, we are scheduled to resume in-person worship here at St. Paul's. The ongoing pandemic necessitates a limitation in attendance, so reservations are necessary. If you are planning on worshiping with us, you can make your reservations through the church's website. That is the preferred option. The second option for those of you who do not have access to the first option is to call the church office. But I hope that you will be able to join us for our in-person service next Sunday as we resume in-person worship. These online services will continue, and worship will continue in its present format for the time being. Thank you to Nancy Kramer for lovely altar flowers in loving memory of George. Thank you also to Jamie Zabo in providing another set of beautiful altar flowers. These flowers celebrate the 50th wedding anniversary of Karen and Alan Radovich. Congratulations, Karen and Alan. Let us praise our God. Holy mystery, source of all being, word and spirit. Let us praise and exalt God above all forever. Good morning, everyone. As Pastor just said, let us praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Please sing along for our first hymn. Praise to the Lord. Good morning to our youngest Christians. I'm Mr. Cruz and I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Today, I'd like to talk with you about a mystery. Now, the dictionary says a mystery 
is something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. Can you think of something that reminds you of a mystery? You might think of the intricate patterns of the stars and their courses throughout the universe. Or you might think of the mystery of how dinosaurs disappeared from the face of the planet. Or the age-old mystery of how dogs always eat our homework. Well, I think one of the best examples of a mystery is God. With all of our intelligence and knowledge, our ability to think logically and reason, with all of that, we still only know a very small amount about God. God is a vast mystery with many secrets. But he has revealed one secret to us. His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, in our lesson today from the book of John, one of the twelve disciples, Philip, is speaking with Jesus. And he says, Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Now, I don't blame Philip for asking that question. It's the longing and the cry of all Christians to know and see God that we might better understand him. It's a longing within each of us. And Jesus answered by saying, How long have I been with you, and yet you do not know me, Philip? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you ask, show us the Father? God has revealed himself to us through his son, Jesus. And through Jesus, God has revealed how much he loves us and his plan of salvation for us. On our own, we would never understand how much God truly loves us without Jesus. And on our own, we will never understand all of the intricate patterns of the stars and their courses throughout the universe. But we know the one who created them does. And just as surely as he guides those stars, he loves us and is planning, charting, a safe course for us. Would you bow your heads as I say a prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing your love for us through Jesus, your Son. And thank you for charting a safe course for us to life eternal with you. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. Will you continue in prayer with me this morning? And as you pray, will you remember Nancy Thompson and also Nancy Kendall in your prayers? Will you join me now in quiet prayer?
Our gracious God, out of chaos and darkness in the beginning, you brought into being the splendor of the universe and the world in all its beauty. And we praise you and thank you for this mystery. At the right time, you sent your Son to be the light of the world, to lead us out of spiritual darkness into the marvelous brightness of your truth. In him has dawned the day of resurrection life. O oh God, we praise you and thank you for this most holy mystery. Of all, all the noise and movement of this world today, we look for the coming of your peace, a new heaven and earth, the holy city of God. We believe in our Lord's promise that he will come again in great power and glory to establish your kingdom. And for this mystery, we praise you and give you thanks. We thank you, though we cannot see you, that you are in this world by your Spirit, preparing a people for this next great cosmic event. And for this mystery, we praise you and give you thanks. We thank you that you are healing lives that have been torn and broken by sin, and that you are filling us with joy and hope. And for this mystery, we praise you and give you thanks. Lord, we await the dawning of that new day. When the earth shall be filled with your glory as the waters cover the sea. And to that mystery, we praise you and thank you forevermore. And we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we bring our offerings to the Lord today, we remember the words of Jesus, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. As we share in making our offerings to the Lord, we receive the gift of a piece of recorded music from Gordy Triefenbach and Sam Click.
you pray? Wonderful, amazing, mysterious God, thank you for raising Jesus Christ from the dead, bringing us the promise of new life. And with the dawning of this another new day, we ask, will you help us to continue to awake to new opportunities to love and serve you and witness to Christ whom you have raised? Will you use us and our gifts to your glory? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading for today comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. We're going to begin at verse 8 and read on to verse 10. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. We have made it to the mountaintop. We are halfway through our list of the 12 apostles, Christ's cabinet. We have already shared about six of these men who changed the history of our world. Today we will look at the apostle Philip. And let's begin by looking at Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper, one more time. You will see Philip is highlighted here by the great artist da Vinci. He is in the bright, and you will note that he is one of the two apostles that da Vinci paints 
without a beard. Perhaps Leonardo is portraying him as one of the youngest apostles. We don't know his age. The Bible doesn't tell us. Thank you, Brian. The stories which feature Philip in the New Testament are all found, interestingly enough, in the Gospel according to John. In chapter 1, we read that Jesus called Philip, follow me, Jesus said, and Philip did. But Philip also went to fetch a friend of his named Nathaniel. And he told Nathaniel about Jesus. Nathaniel asked this question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip replies, come and see. Later in chapter 6, Jesus is surrounded by thousands of people. They have followed Jesus out into the wilderness just to listen to him teach. And in chapter 6, Jesus turns to Philip specifically and asks him, where will we find enough food to feed all these people? John says he's actually testing Philip, and Philip looks over the crowd and exclaims, 200 denarii, or 200 days wages, wouldn't begin to feed all of these people. In chapter 12, we read where some visitors are in Jerusalem. They're Greeks, and they've come for the Passover, and they want to see Jesus. They find Philip, who, interestingly enough, has a Greek name. And Philip, we're told, seeks out Andrew, and they help introduce these Greeks to Jesus. And then, finally, today's story. Jesus is saying farewell to his disciples in the upper room. He is going away. He is promising them that he is going to prepare a place for them. He is promising them that he will give them the Spirit who will be a presence for them. And in the midst of this farewell discourse by Jesus, Philip interrupts and says, Jesus, show us the Father. And that will be enough. And we heard just a moment ago Jesus' reply, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Do you notice any threads, common threads, running through these four stories told about Philip. There are probably several, but one that stands out to me is in each of these stories, Philip displays a practical, no-nonsense, down-to-earth common sense. When Nathaniel asks, he says, come and see. Jesus asked, how are they going to feed all these thousands? He looks out and he immediately takes out his calculator and begins to compute how many days' wages it would take to feed them. There in the upper room, he says plainly, just show us, Jesus. Show us the Father. Show us God. And that will be enough. Very commonsensical, I think. Very practical. I like practical people. I've discovered that practical people seem to have this ability to focus on what is most salient, essential, or noteworthy about a particular issue or topic at hand just as Philip does in today's story. You're going away, Jesus. Just show us the Father, and that will be enough. The famous church historian Martin Marty wrote that the most prominent, salient, noteworthy aspect about God 
is not that God is all-powerful. It is not that God is omniscient. It is not even that there is a God. But Martin Marty writes that the most prominent thing about God is that God cannot be seen. The most prominent thing about God, Martin Marty wrote, is God's hiddenness. It's this hiddenness of God that Philip is indirectly alluding to when he asks Jesus, show us the Father. You see, it implies we can't see the Father. The Father is hidden from us. The Father is a mystery. Jesus, will you show him to us? Over and over in the pages of Scripture, the Bible tells us that God is a mystery. In speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus says, God is a spirit. The answer to the question, why can't we see God, was given to me when I was a child in Sunday school. I remember the teacher saying, we can't see God because God is so different from us. And anything we know, even if we did see God, we couldn't possibly understand God or comprehend God. God would literally blow our minds. That's what the Bible says. In the Old Testament it says that no one can see God and live. That's the Bible's way of saying we cannot comprehend God. I liked my Sunday school teacher's answer back then, and it still satisfies me today. I like that God is him. I like that God is a mystery. You see, I am naturally a curious person. And God being hidden actually serves to attract me to God. I think it's actually a beautiful thing. I think the fact that God is mystery serves us in very practical ways. Hence, Philip's practical question. Listen to what Albert Einstein said. The most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. And listen to this. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Do you understand what he's saying? I think he's saying the beginning, the foundation of all true art and true science is mystery, the unknown. And the Bible says God is mystery. The fact that God is mystery moves me to worship. I can't imagine worshiping anything that I felt I had walked all the way around and completely comprehended. No, in order for me to worship, there must be something of mystery. Jeremy Taylor once said, a religion without mystery must be a religion without God. Mystery enriches and enables and draws me into an authentic worship experience. To stand in awe and wonder and astonishment and to recognize that I am just one being in this vast creation, created by a creator moves me to worship. The fact that God
God is mysterious. Fits well with my understanding of life. To me, life is mysterious. Life is filled with the unknown and surprises. I wouldn't have it any other way. The fact of the matter is, I make my plans and preparations as I should, but I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know what will happen this afternoon. I don't know what will happen five minutes from now. Life is filled with mystery. I don't know when my day will come. I don't know what other people will do. I think about our current circumstances in this pandemic, and I do not know what the future holds. If there is one thing these last 13 months have shown me over and over again, is the mystery of the world in which we live. The unknown, the uncertainty of it all. The confusion, the conflict, the uncertainty. The mystery. Life is a mystery. And even the things that I think I know, I do not know. There is a sense in which trying to explain God is like trying to explain a kiss. We all know what a kiss is, do we? Can we explain it? You can look up kiss in the dictionary. This is what it says. A caress with the lips, a gentle touch or contact. But does that really do it? Does that really fully describe what happens when a mother tenderly places her lips on the forehead of her newborn child? Or when two young lovers say goodnight at the end of the evening? No. I can't describe something I think I know. Life is a mystery. George Meredith wrote, Here we are, you and I, and the millions of men and animals about us, the innumerable atoms which make our bodies blown, as it were, by mysterious processes together so that there has happened just now for every one of us the wonder of wonders. We have come to life. And here we stand with our senses, our keen intellects, our infinite devices, our nerves quivering the touch of joy or pain, beacons of brief fire burning between two unexplored eternities. What are we to make of this wonder while it is still ours? Life is Can you explain it? I recall reading where Queen Elizabeth, the lately widowed Queen Elizabeth, not upon the death of her husband, but long ago, in speaking to the people of her land after September the 11th, said this, Grief is the price we pay for love. Why should that be? It's a mystery. And when I begin to account of all that I know, I realize all that I have yet to learn, all that I do not know, and I take a strange comfort fact that God is a mystery. God is so closely linked with life that God is a mystery. And that strangely, strangely satisfies me. I prefer it that way. But to say God is a mystery 
is not to say we don't know anything about God. In fact, to say that God is a mystery is to say we know something about God. But we know more than that, do we not? Jesus says God is a spirit, but Jesus, in response to Philip's question, also says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Karl Barth said that God is so far removed and beyond us that the only thing we can know about God is what God graciously chooses to reveal about himself to us. And God has graciously chosen to reveal to us his Son. We do know something about God because Jesus. The Christian faith says God has revealed God's very self to us, God's very heart to us, and God has revealed God's self to us in a number of ways through reason and experience and nature and through the scriptures, but most of all, most importantly and most clearly through Jesus of Nazareth, God's spoken word made flesh. And when we look at Jesus, found in the pages of the New Testament and through the lives of faithful followers and through his church, when guided by the Spirit, what do we see of God? We see that this eternal, ineffable mystery has a heart beats like a loving father's heart. That this very mysterious God provides and protects and pursues us and plans for our future. We can feel it, but we cannot describe it. Perhaps it is best left to music or the poets like Shelley who wrote the awful shadow of some unseen power floats though unseen amongst us. And we know that that unseen power, that awful shadow is a loving thought prompting us and guiding us and working out his mysterious ways to bring about what Jesus promised he would bring about. Peace, love, and life eternal. This is all we really need. rest is mystery. And following along with the theme of God being a mystery, our last hymn is the powerful Welsh melody, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Please join me in singing.
stand in body or in spirit for our closing blessing. The blessing of God, the creator of all life, be upon you always. The blessing of God, the redeemer of our world, be in your words and deeds. The blessing of God, the sanctifier of life, be with you all now and evermore. So be it. Alleluia. Amen. Will you be seated?